Thank you, um, uh, Thank you also for the organizing committee uh, for inviting me, for sharing with you my thoughts on cancer pregnancy, and in particular, thank you for, to Irina for um, asking me, and also for this, uh, not only the invitation, but also the way how you showed us your beautiful city of St. Petersburg. It's truly an honor to be here. It's also my duty, basically, to tell you that uh, this whole day is supported by the European Society of Gynecological Oncology. Um, in fact, I learned to know Elena when we together were in the ESGO Council, and I have to say that I do believe that it is a really strong organization with a lot of educational tasks and skills. So my topic here is on cancer in pregnancy. Um, my take home message uh, after this very busy day, what I want you to, to, um, to memorize is that surgery, radiotherapy and chemotherapy are possible during pregnancy. When you have to choose between prematurity and chemotherapy, it's better to deliver chemotherapy to the pregnant woman and that this is a complex situation and that an interdiscipli interdisciplinary approach in referral centers with a high risk obstetrical unit is in fact mandatory. As Pedro said this morning, the highest level of evidence are the randomized controlled trials. But unfortunately, this is not the case in cancer in pregnancy. We cannot randomize our patients. So our highest level is more observational studies, cohort studies. This is the agenda. I will not go through it. It will be obvious. Um, but I'd like to start with a case study. And I think that case study shows us what we can mean for our patients. This is an MRI of a 28-year-old non-smoker, non-drinker, and you see a tongue cancer, which is already going to the other side of the, the tongue. Um, so three to four centimeter, they will suspect nodes. She was actually referred to our department to do a determination of pregnancy, allowing oncologists to treat her. But then she knew about our project. We discussed the whole um, situation. She was operated for nine hours during the second trimester of pregnancy. Unfortunately, there were nodes available, so she needed radio chemotherapy. Um, this was actually how we prepared the radiotherapy. This is a phantom, the head, the thorax, the abdomen, the shielding, and we calculate basically the fetal exposure, which appeared to be below the threshold dose of fetal safety. And as a result, the patient was irradiated during pregnancy for uh, nodal positivity. This is where we are today. This is the, the patient. She was pregnant from Zoe, and in the meantime, she de delivered for a second child. This is what we can mean. She was referred to us for a termination of pregnancy, and here she is, and she's still doing fine today. So, I want to share with you epidemiology, diagnosis, and staging. This is a recent update of the all the cases uh, we have in INSIP, so in International uh, Network on Cancer, Infertility, and Pregnancy. The registry contains 2,653 cases. More than 2,000 of them are actually cancer in pregnancy patients. If we look into these data, this is a breakdown of all the cancer types we see. And as you can see, that most uh, important are the breast cancers, lymphoma, cervical cancer, uh, leukemia, and ovarian cancer. So quite a lot of gynecological cancers. In fact, we can say that this is the breakdown of cancers in young women of reproductive age. So cancer or cancer diagnosis does not, or pregnancy does not predispose to any particular type of cancer. Huh? These are the cancers we see in women of this age. Basically, one in 1,000, 2,000 pregnancies. For Europe, that means 2,500 to 5,000 cases a yearly. So it is an uncommon condition, but if you look to European figures, actually it is quite considerable. The problem we then face in, during pregnancy is that the gestational uh, symptoms can mimic cancer symptoms. For example, for breasts, breasts are more en uh, engorged. So then here we see, this results in a late diagnosis. And you see here a patient with inflammatory breast cancer, and you can see already from far that already there is an axillary lymph node involvement. And here we see that this breast also contains, is replaced basically for more than two thirds of the breast by cancer. Um, so overall, um, and also for other uh, cancer types, it is um, 
we know that the stage is a bit higher than when compared to non-pregnant women. So this is a message for mainly obstetricians that every complaint of a pregnant woman should be taken seriously. We have to stage our patients as non-pregnant patients. Um, and basically, um, the, the major uh, message is that sonography and magnetic resonance are considered safe and are preferred, especially for the pelvis and the abdomen, um, because all the other examinations are associated with uh, radiation exposure. The threshold dose for fetal damage is 10 to 20 centigrade. And from this table, you can see that most of the times, for most examinations, we are well below this threshold dose. So even it is technically possible, still we prefer sonography and magnetic resonance imaging. Then for the breast, the message is we have to do a sonography. This is the same breast, at the right by mammogram, at the left by sonar. And here, we don't see any particular cancer. This is dense glandular tissue related to pregnancy. But if you do a sonar on that same breast, you see a large irregular tumor. So we should not be sufficient with mammogram. That's the clinical message here. Then for breast, if we do uh, more staging, we can do a chest x-ray, liver ultrasound, bone metastasis can be excluded by MRI. Um, if an MRI is not possible, we can do a bone scan. Of course, that uses a radioactive tracer. If you put a bladder catheter, that means there is no accumulation of radioactivity close to the fetus, so we consider this to be safe. But of course, if we have a choice, we would prefer the MRI. And the next slides are on the Sentinel lymph node biopsy. We do believe that this is safe. Um, there are two reasons for that. Um, the, in fact, we use low dosages, and 90% of the radioactivity is captured in the lymph node. And that results in the fact that the fetal dose is actually very low and much lower than the threshold dose. What you may not be expect is that even for vulva cancer, it is safe. Despite the fact that, of course, the vulva is closer to the pregnancy, but for the same reasons, also this can be done in vulva cancer. New techniques may, may go to the use of Indocene green, uh, which is more experimental in this situation, but it has been reported, so that might be an alternative. In all patients, we do not recommend patent blue, because that can be associated with anaphylactic reactions, which is particular, particularly difficult to treat in um, pregnant women. But also maternal safety is important. Um, I will not go through the details of the slide, um, but what we want to say is that in uh, 97 uh, patients, we had one patient with an ipsilateral axillary recurrence, which is more or less comparable with what we see in the non-pregnant population. So also the oncological safety of uh, the Sentinel lymph node seems to be valid. What we use in our setting is the whole body diffusion weighted MRI, um, which is um, a particular type of uh, MRI that is more sensitive than traditional imaging methods. This is conventional MRI. We see the liver, which is normal, but with this uh, whole body diffusion weighted MRI, we see a liver metastasis that was proven by biopsy. Um, so in our setting, this is what we uh, offer to our patients. All patients get uh, this type of whole body MRI to detect um, metastatic disease. A lot of confusion existed until recently on the safety of MRI, and as in particular to the use of gadolinium. A recent paper um, in JAMA 2016 on more than 1,400,000 deliveries, and it showed that actually MRI used during the first trimester of pregnancy is safe. Importantly, they had information on the use of gadolinium, and in fact, this was associated with rheumatological, inflammatory, infiltrative skin decisions, conditions, even stillbirth or neonatal death. So there was a lot of confusion until this study. Now, gadolinium is contraindicated. We don't give it unless it will really alter, change your clinical practice. We all know the non-invasive prenatal testing. Um, we do believe, and it is our experience, that the, the incidence of cancer during pregnancy will increase due to the NIPT. Uh, NIPT means that we look for fetal DNA uh, in the blood, which is then 5 to 20 percent. But if you take that blood sample, if you take that free-floating DNA, you also have maternal DNA. And um, 
In fact, this is a case that, um, actually our first case, and I may, may be the first case ever reported on, um, actually a patient where the geneticist came to us and say, Friedrich, this baby is normal, but there's a problem with the mother. This signature, this copy number alterations, that's the signature of cancer. So in our project, we um, did this whole body MRI, and we saw retrosternal mass that proved to be Hodgkin lymphoma. We subsequently then um, looked whether these alterations in the blood were the same as the alterations in the tumor, and those were the same. So we had three genes that we, where we looked at, and they were the same actually in the nipped and the fish done in the cancer. So we are sure that the alterations in the blood are derived from the cancer. And we had then five other cases then published in JAMA Oncology. Um, and uh, since then, there are more and more uh, cases. So apart from women getting older and getting high risk of getting cancer in pregnancy, this is the second reason why cancer diagnosis will be more commonly diagnosed asymptomatically in our pregnant population. I can be quite short on surgery. We have a lot of experience with surgery in pregnant women. In most of the cases, this is surgery for benign disease. And in fact, the principles for anesthesiology are the same, independent of the condition why you operate. The most important thing is adequate oxygenation and left lateral tilt position are important. If you take care for the mother, you will take care for the baby. Don't worry about that. What about fetal monitoring during surgery? At the left, we see a patient who was 20 weeks pregnant. This patient, this baby is non-viable. In case of any fetal distress, we would not do an emergency cesarean section. That's why at the left, there is no fetal monitoring. At the right, this patient was 29 weeks pregnant. Of course, we would go for a urgent cesarean section. And that's why this patient is monitored. And we see that the baby is actually sleeping together with the mother. I'm not sure whether there are obstetricians in the ward. Maybe not. But I can promise you, normally, there is much more variation and variability. Eh? which is absent here. This means that the baby is also sleeping. And together, we can monitor for, fetal, for maternal contractions. Um, tocolytic drugs, there are no good data, but we, sh we do believe that we, we should give them when there is any manipulation of the uterus. Apart from that, surgery per se is no indication, we do believe, to routinely administer this. Of course, thrombosis, cancer is an... Um, does predispose to uh, up thrombosis and also pregnancy. So if you combine both, thrombosis prophylaxis is mandatory. Also, laparoscopy is possible. In fact, there are two entry pathways. Um, we can use a varus needle in the upper left quadrant, but then you have to point the needle caudally and you have to do deflate the stomach in order not to perforate the stomach, in order not to perforate the spleen. Alternatively, what I prefer the most is to do an open introduction in the midline and also here not to use the varus needle because I don't want to puncture the um, pregnant uterus. Radiotherapy. I already showed you one case. The reason why we could do this radiotherapy of this patient with a tongue cancer is that we consider radiotherapy safe during the first and second trimester of pregnancy, but not safe during the third trimester. What happens is that during the third trimester, the baby grows and comes closer to the field of irradiation. That means that then the conceptus dose, in fact, becomes too high. Um, so if you have a threshold dose of 10 to 20 centigrade, you see that in the third trimester, frequently, you're above this threshold dose. But this has to be calculated every time for each individual patient. This is a patient also from our clinic. Um, this is uh, Professor Van den Heuvel, he's a physicist, and he calculates in detail for that particular patient, for that particular gestational age, what would be the fetal exposure. Also for this patient who was operated for breast cancer, it was a small tumor, hormone positive, but she just did not need chemotherapy. The only thing adjuvant that she needed at that stage was radiotherapy. So we delivered radiotherapy during the second trimester of pregnancy, and you see how well the fetus is protected. But you will always have fetal exposure because of the internal scatter that will go everywhere, but also um, to the fetus. So you will never be able to completely avoid fetal exposure, but you can do your best to minimize this. 
a lot of things are going on on chemotherapy, and I will lead you through it. Um, first, um, this is uh, the, from the third um, consensus meeting we had with the, uh, mainly with the, also with the German breast group, and we do believe that we can give chemotherapy, but if we give the chemotherapy during pregnancy, the pregnancy per se is not a reason to change the dose. No, we say maintain the dose, use the standard protocols, and use the actual body weight, because normally patients once are weight, weighted, and then um, that weight is used for the next weeks and months. But in pregnancy, of course, this changes every time. So stick to the actual body weight. Also, pregnancy is not a reason to increase the dose. Um, and we recommend to discontinue chemotherapy at 35 to 37 weeks of gestation. Um, we can use dose-dense regimens, but we do believe that dose-dense and intensified dose regimens are in fact too toxic for the mother. You will, get, you will need to give additional blood, the, to, the risk for infection is too high. So this is what we would not um, advocate during pregnancy. For the gynae cancers, in fact, most drugs that we use in the non-pregnant population are considered to, to be safe enough also during pregnancy. Regarding to the supportive drugs, Everybody of you who already administered chemotherapy during pregnancy um, will know that, in fact, they have less side effects, probably due to chemodilution. So the first message is only use drugs when it's really necessary. If it's necessary, you can use most of the drugs, with one exception, and these are the corticosteroids, which are mentioned here. The reason is that we prefer methylprednisolone, since dexamethasone gives a risk of cleft palate in the first trimester, and dexa and beta metazone can give attention deficit disorders, specifically if you give this repeatedly during the pregnancy. But luckily, we have an alternative, so uh, methylprednisolone. Methylprednisolone is metabolized in the placenta and does not cross to the, to the fetus. Important message on Herceptin, uh, which is a targeted treatment you're all aware of. Herceptin crosses the placenta. Um, in fact, it does not uh, result in any congenital malformation, but what happens is that also the uh, nephron, the kidney, contains this CRB2 receptor. That means that if we give Herceptin, the baby will not produce urine anymore. And ur urine is the basis for amniotic fluid. And amniotic fluid, it was a baby needs to exercise the lungs. So if you give Herceptin the whole trimester, there will be no amniotic fluid and your baby will be born normally, but he, will, he or she will die from respiratory distress because the lungs are not exercised. So that's why this is not used during pregnancy. Also, imatinib actually not used during the first trimester, but from the sec second trimester on, we do believe we can use it. Also, if needed, we have an alternative, which is interferon alpha, which is not interacting with uh, DNA, which can safely be used. It is not considered chemotherapic drugs. Important is that we showed um, that for the four drugs, doxorubicin, epirubicin, docetaxel, and paclitaxel, this is the area under the curve, this is the Cmax. For the four drugs um, investigated, we see that there is actually uh, a lower area under the curve and a lower Cmax. So this is the chemodilution due to the uh, gestational uh, stage. And in fact, as you can see at the right, paclitaxel, it's a quite an important um, dilution um, that explains less side effects, but we are a little bit scared about the prognosis. Is chemotherapy during pregnancy as effective as in non-pregnant uh, women? Of course, this is also a point of attention in our group. Um, you need actually a lot of cases to really investigate this. Um, together with the German breast group, we looked into this, and in breast cancer at least, we did see no difference. But we have to say that these data are not solid enough, the numbers are not solid enough to provide uh, good data. We are working on this, and we hope by the end of this year to have an update using more than 405 cases of, of pregnant women with breast cancer who had chemotherapy during pregnancy. And we hope that these data will be more solid. But until now, it appears to be um, quite safe or we have no reason not to use it during <laughs> pregnancy. The reason why we can use chemotherapy during pregnancy is that the placenta is in fact an active organ. The placenta um, uh, is a barrier for some drugs and um, therefore the not all the chemotherapy that we administer to the woman 
comes to the fetal compartment. We looked into this in the fetal, um, in the pregnant baboon model. These are the drugs that we did investigate. These are the concentrations we saw in the baboon. And you see that in all investigated drugs, the levels of the drug in the fetus were lower or much lower when compared to the mother. Um, so this gives us a bit of feeling of safety, which of course needs to be uh, shown, proven in studies. And that is what I want to show you now. Um, we are all aware that the pregnant situation is a vulnerable situation. We ask our pregnant women not to drink alcohol because this results in fetal alcohol syndrome. We ask our pregnant patients not to smoke uh, because this results in intrauterine growth restriction. This results in, in uh, intrauterine death. Um, and that's why we ask them not to smoke. But then suddenly we, st we tell our patients, but chemotherapy, that is in fact possible. Chemotherapy is designed to kill rapidly dividing cells. And um, still, we administer this. And this is Leslie, who receives FEC, fluorocyl epidermosin and cyclophosphamide for breast cancer during the second trimester of pregnancy. So I want to share with you what we tell her that she maintains laughing while undergoing chemotherapy during pregnancy. Well, the first thing we tell Leslie is that if you give chemotherapy after the second or the third trimester of pregnancy, this does not result in more or other congenital malformations when compared to the background population. What you see in red are the major malformations. Um, these are the treatments during pregnancy. And you see that we had the major malformations basically in the groups that did not receive chemotherapy. In here, we had some malformations, but hip subluxation or rectal atresia are one of the common, actually, congenital malformations. So this also has been confirmed in other studies. Then we tell our patients that um, we show them these data uh, showing that if you uh, look into the IQ score, there is actually a positive correlation with the gestational age, suggesting that, in fact, prematurity is more a problem, but not the chemotherapy. But of course, we lack a control group here. Um, so it is reassuring that we know that the patient who delivered term, in fact, the cognitive outcome of the baby was normal. But we don't know here whether this is now really correlated to the prematurity or to the chemotherapy. And that's why we set up then a larger trial um, that I will tell you right now. In this population, we also had a group of patients who are actually older, eight to nine years old, numbers are not so high, but the advantage of testing a, a child which is older is that you can uh, test more functions. You can look into behavior, memory, and attention. And in fact, all these results were normal. But again, this is reassuring, but we lack a control group. Um, and these data were then published in the New England Journal of Medicine. Um, New England did not want to to report on that without a control group. So we did what New England asked and um, included a control group, 129 controlled children. And here we had 129 studied children at the age of um, 18 months or 36 months. I will briefly go into the details. Of course, all these mothers received different types of uh, cancer treatment, but also uh, they, they were exposed to the stress, to the radiologic examinations, to all the supportive drugs. So it's not only chemotherapy, it's much more than, than that. Um, so we did looked into the general health, we looked into the cognitive outcome, and we looked into the um, heart functions of these children. This is actually one of the two most important figures. This is the cognitive outcome, and we see that there's actually no difference between the control group and the study group. We looked into different uh, subgroups of different types of chemotherapy, surgery, or radiotherapy. But in fact, in the subgroups, there were no differences between in black, the study group, and in gray, the controls. This is for radiotherapy. Some children received radiotherapy, but there was no link between the fetal dose uh, that we delivered. You could question whether one or two cycles of chemotherapy or six or seven types, cycles of chemotherapy was a difference. Well, we looked into that, but in fact, also that did not impact the outcome. The second most important slide of this study is this one. And you see the same the similarity between the, uh, the figure where we had no controls. In fact, it's the same tendency, but here, and, and the same tendency, but for both groups. From, from this slide, from this uh, figure, we know that actually prematurity is worse than chemotherapy. Yeah? So even in the group 
uh, in the control group, basically, you had the same tendency of a worse outcome in preterm children in the same order as the uh, study group. So from this slide, from this figure, we can say that if you choose between chemotherapy or deliver the baby prenate, um, preterm, go for the chemotherapy and try to prolong pregnancy and deliver the baby term. I'm not a cardiologist. I should just show these figures to show that we looked into detail um, um, with fancy techniques and high level um, uh, methods to our children. Um, basically, um, we did not see, and you, look, you see a lot of parameters that basically we went through, we controlled, but in fact there are no clinical relevant differences between the study group and the um, control group. Um, this is particularly in, important because these children were exposed to anthracyclines, which are notorious for their cardiotoxic effects. There is one point of attention regarding the hearing loss. Um, in fact, there is a, a paper in, in the literature um, where a, a mother was exposed to cisplatin, cervical cancer, five cycles of 70 milligram per square meter, and this boy had severe bilateral perceptive hearing loss. So we do believe, and especially important in gynec cancers also, we try to replace cisplatin by, car by carboplatin, which is less autotoxic. So we definitely should be careful. This is my preferred slide, basically. All these children were exposed to chemotherapy during pregnancy. Um, and I can promise all of you, if you put 10 children on a row and two of them were exposed to chemotherapy, well, you will not see the difference between the two. Uh, me neither. But most importantly, our researchers who go into detail into their functions cannot make the distinction between these children. Last part is on the multidisciplinary setting. Um, published last year ago, um, basically we could look into a 20-year um, evolution of more than 1,000 patients. And we saw that chemotherapy was also associated with neonatal intensive care unit admissions and with small for gestational age babies. It was interesting to see over the evolution that, um, so these are the three uh, time frames, 2005, 2005, 2009, and after 2010, basically there was a higher tendency to give chemotherapy, um, and there were less actually patients, there was a decreasing tendency to give no treatment. And if you look to the obstetric outcome, there was an increase in overall live births and a decrease in preterm uh, live births. So less terminations, less prematurity, but in fact more cancer treatment, which is related to small for gestational age babies and NICU admission. So that's why we need to treat our patients in these obstetrical high care units, especially when we give antenatal chemotherapy. This is a checklist for obstetricians. Um, most important is at diagnosis to confirm the diagnosis and to exclude any pre-existing anomaly. And then if you give chemotherapy, do really follow up. Every time you give the chemotherapy, you follow up the growth, and if the growth really decreases too much, you have to stop the chemotherapy. The, but very important is that the involvement of the obstetrician is really important when decision making in, in each decision making process. One slide on the multidisciplinary aspect. This is for breast cancer as an example. These are the specialists that are involved. Um, even more paramedics are involved, but then especially if there is a child on board, you have all the other specialisms. So all these specialisms you can only offer actually in centers that are large enough, who have sufficient volume to have all these specialists and paramedics on board. Discussion between the obstetrician and the surgeon and, or the oncologist is important. And I'll give you two examples. This is a patient with cervical cancer. We advised our obstetricians when we did a cesarean section not to do a lower transverse incision because there are reports on abdominal wound metastasis. We just can hypothesize that basically if you do a lower transverse incision, you cut through the cancer and you metastasize this during the surgery in the abdominal wound. That's why we advocate our obstetricians to do a corporeal incision, to stay as far as possible from the cancer. So, but we have to tell them um, and discuss this. And the second point is, this is the same patient basically, she had positive pelvic lymph nodes. The baby was uh, taken, was delivered, and then this patient was a candidate for radiotherapy. And then we helped the radiotherapy to guide, to tailor the field of radiation by doing a parotic lymphadenectomy. Um, so also here that needs to be discussed and prepared very well. 
So I want to repeat my take home message. I hope I could show you that surgery, radiotherapy and chemotherapy are possible, that chemotherapy is quite safe for the baby and that prematurity is in fact worse than the chemotherapy and that this lastly interdisciplinary approach um, in a referral center with a high risk of central unit is important. This is also an invitation for you to um, further contribute to the international network of cancer in pregnancy uh, and fertility. You see how the, the countries that are on board. Luckily, Russia is uh, also on board and was one of the first countries to be on board, thanks to uh, Elena. Um, another other message is that this uh, we also register fertility preservation. Um, so this is an example of the online registry um, where there is one uh, item on fertility preservation and how we further go into detail. Um, just a very short update where we are now. This we started only in 2014 and today we have nearly 400 um, cases. So we further will elaborate on this and hope to report on that in uh, the near future. I want to thank all the organizations that support our research, that pay our research. Um, I want to invite you or those who are interested next year, not so far from here, um, I do believe is Minsk, uh, where we have the next uh, yearly Internet INSIP uh, meeting, 2nd and 3 of April. Um, this is the research team in Amsterdam and Leuven that helps delivering all the data that I shared with you. Um, I have to thank our patients with, uh, who want to contribute uh, to the study, who regularly come to have their children examined in our setting. I thank you for your attention.